This evening, I will be discussing the foundry type endeavors of the 19th century in the Kannada and Telugu scripts, particularly focusing on the initiative of European and American print establishments. Before getting into the main topic, a disclaimer, I do not know Kannada and Telugu. My mother tongue is Tamil. I spent most of my 20s working as a graphic designer and then as a type designer based out of Bangalore, where Kannada is the primary language. At that time, I was also married to a Telugu speaker for about seven years. My interaction with these two languages and scripts were influenced by these two life events. By no means am I a native or an expert. Let me start by introducing the basics of the Kannada and Telugu languages and scripts and the motivation for my research. Kannada and Telugu are two languages that are spoken in South India in adjacent regions. They are written using the Kannada and Telugu scripts respectively. These two scripts are also used to write some minority languages. Kannada is spoken predominantly in the state of Karnataka and Telugu in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. According to the 2011 census of India, Kannada is spoken by 44 million people approximately and Telugu by 81 million people. To give these numbers a perspective, the number of Kannada speakers can be compared to the population of Spain, about 46 million people, and Telugu to that of Germany, about 83 million people. Yet, similar to many other scripts used in the Indian subcontinent, Kannada and Telugu have a limited number of high quality typefaces as well as academic literature from a type design perspective. As a practicing typeface designer working on scripts of the Indian subcontinent, the first thing I notice and one notices is that the modulation of stroke contrast, modulation and stroke contrast is applied parallel to the baseline in the Kannada and Telugu scripts. This is reversed from what is observed in standard Latin types. The reason for the atypical modulation and stroke contrast always remained perplexing to me and, to, and possibly to many other designers as well. Thiro Kannada and Telugu types designed by Fiona Ross and John Hudson have been used to typeset this presentation. Second, Kannada and Telugu are closely related scripts. The American linguist William Bright and Stanford Stever have suggested that during the 19th century, separate scripts for Kannada and Telugu were standardized by the printing efforts of Christine mission organizations. The image that you are looking at is an inscription of the old Kannada script from the Siddhara Baske at Sharavana Belagola, Hassan district, Karnataka. This inscription was either made during the year 1398 or 1432. The old Kannada script is a descendant of the Brahmi script. This old Kannada script split to form the two closely related Kannada and Telugu scripts. However, the role of type making and the divergence of the script has not been academically explained. Therefore, Bright's suggestion played a pivotal role in defining the scope of my research. The main focus question of this research was what factors from the foundry type period are responsible for shaping the typographic forms of the Kannada and Telugu scripts. This research also intended to answer the following ancillary questions. What role did type making play in the divergence of the Kannada and Telugu scripts? When were modulation and stroke contrast introduced to scripts with monolinearity? What kind of modulation and stroke contrast is present in foundry types? Where does it draw its influence? What factors contributed to the standardization of typographic forms? Did the available typographic palette satisfy the printing requirements? How can the fonts from the foundry type period inform current type design practice? The time frame for my research was focused from the advent of type making in the Telugu script in 1800 by the East India Company to the turn of the century in 1900. The outbreak of the First World War and the ensuing Second World War of 
unobstructed missionary activity as the war diverted Western efforts. By the end of the two wars, the independence of the Indian subcontinent in 1947 saw Western colonizers and settlers lead the geographic region. These events, along with the change in type-making and typesetting technologies, limited the majority of the Western foundry type-making endeavors in the Indian subcontinent to that of the 19th century. The typology of a writing system has an effect on printing in that particular system, especially with foundry types. According to Elizabeth Eisenstein, the difference between the uneven development of printing in Asia and its rapid exploitation in the West has something to do with the difference between ideographic and alphabetic systems of writing. Given this background, it is also essential to have a basic understanding of the Kannada and Telugu writing system. The Kannada and Telugu, and Telugu scripts consist of about 50 primary characters, including vowels, consonant, and some letters such as the Anuswara and the Visarga that are considered part vowel and part consonant. The Kannada and Telugu scripts are written horizontally from left to right. This table only shows the primary vowels and consonants. The first letter form on the left is Kannada and the right is Telugu. Typing systems can be classified into a variety of typologies that include alphabets, alpha syllabaries, syllabaries, logograms, pictograms, objects, and phonetic writing. The Kannada and Telugu writing systems are alpha syllabic. The vowels have two forms when they appear at the beginning of a word. They are denoted by their full form. The vowels also have a medial form where they take the shape of a vowel marker. The consonants have an inherent vowel that is changed by muting or by adding a vowel marker. The vowel markers usually combine with the upper part of the consonant to form ligatures. Consonants can also combine with itself to form conjunct consonant clusters. In the two scripts, the initial consonant retains its complete form while the combining consonant sits to the bottom right and occasionally vertically below the primary consonant. When three consonants combine, the third one is written adjacent to the second. The primary difference between the Kannada and Telugu script is the shape of the top hat highlighted in red. The horizontal line curving upwards placed on top of the base letter form identifies the Kannada script while the top hat is a tick-like form in the Telugu script. Also, the formation of ligatures follow different rules. You might observe that some of the ligatures seem similar in their appearance, yet not so similar. The modulation and stroke contrast also distinguish the typographic forms of the Kannada and Telugu script. As the Kannada, tends to gain more weight on the top than that of Telugu due to the presence of the prominent horizontal stroke. And printing in the Indian subcontinent was initiated by the Portuguese Jesuits and it all started with EPA. The central portions of the spice trade were under the control of Arab merchants and on crossing the Mediterranean, it was monopolized by the affluent cities, Italian cities of Venice and Genoa. The exorbitant price of pepper led the Portuguese to seek a shipping path to India. Eventually, the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama found a sea route to India via the Cape of Good Hope and the fleet arrived near Calicut in Kerala, India on the 20th of May 1498. This discovery led to European ships sailing to Asian markets regularly with their primary goal as trade. According to the historian Albertina Ho, the Portuguese believed that their overseas conquests were not purely for trade but also had a genuine desire to spread Christianity. The Patriarch designate of Abyssinia and 14 Jesuits and a printing press landed in Goa on the 6th September 1556. On arrival at Goa, they received a message from the Abyssinian emperor that he was no longer eager to receive the missionaries. This resulted in the first press being available at Goa. There was no urgent need for the press in the Indian subcontinent since the Jesuits relied on political power to spread Christianity. Yet the first printing press was unwittingly at their disposal. This printing press printed the first book in the Tamil language using Tamil type called Tamil Catechism in 1577 in Goa. 
However, the Jesuits found it easier to use Latin fonts rather than casting the vernacular scripts in metal. Consequently, the principal contribution of Jesuits was limited to the introduction of the printing press. However, the, the German theologist and Lutheran missionary, Benjamin Schlutz, printed the first known Telugu book, the Catechismus Telegicus Minor, using wood blocks at Halle, Germany, in 1746. This presentation shows a spread from this book. The Frankie Foundation at Halle also holds subsequent books, four printed copies of Persipicua Explicatio, Doctorine, Christiane, and Via Live Orzo Santos. Schlutz's three other works, Dictionary of Telugu Words, Alphabet of the Telugu Language, and Ein Gesprach, Zweichen, Einen Malabaren, und Warugen, exist only in manuscript form. Schlutz also prepared, prepared a Kannada version of the Lord's Prayer printed with Latin characters in Berlin in 1806. However, as the movable type was not used for the printing of any of these works, these works are of very limited relevance. The first printed material using movable type in the Telugu script that I was able to find is about a column of Telugu text on the first page of the newspaper, the government gazette, dated Thursday, 1st April 1802. This type was punch cut under the supervision of Francis White Ellis, a civil servant of the notorious East India Company. In this talk, we will refer to this font as FET, abbreviated from Francis Ellis Telugu type. So, Ellis started as a writer at the East India Company in 1796. He ascended through promotions to the Assistant Under Secretary, Deputy Secretary, and Secretary to the Board of Revenue in 1798, 1801, and 1802. He became the judge of the Zilla of Machili Patnam in 1806, the collector of land customs of the Madras Presidency in 1809, and the collector of Madras in 1810. Ellis introduced the vaccination against smallpox in the Madras presidency. He also died untimely due to cholera at Ramnath in 1819. Ellis appears to have spearheaded the initiative of cutting FET. The Ellis papers given by G. U. Pope is archived at the Bodleian Library, University of Oxford, records information about his creation. Ellis' primary challenge was to derive an efficient method of composition that ensured uncomplicated type making and typesetting process. He essentially discusses the methods of composition such as the arcand and degree methods that were used during the foundry type period to types of scripts that were not alphabetic. This image demonstrates the degree and archive methods of composition reproduced from Fiona Ross and Graham Shah's book, Non-Latin Scripts from Metal to Digital Type. In the degree method of composition, the main character is placed in the middle and the combining characters are placed adjacent above and below the main characters to form conjunct consonants and ligatures. The Arkham system, on the other hand, uses curling components with shoulders sticking out of the neighboring characters to form ligatures and conjunct consonants. Ellis used a combination of these two methods in the making of this Telugu type. His notes do not appear to be a conclusive record, rather it appears to have been his ideas on how to approach making the first Telugu metal type. Here is an extension of the page where you can see Telugu clearly. Financial records indicate that the total cost of the cutting of FET amounted to 10,004 rupees and 23 paise. Supplementary financial statements show that EIC incurred an additional price of 1,299 and 60 star pagodas in the cutting of uh, FET. Remuneration was paid to four workers for unexplained labor and six workers were involved in filing and casting. Ellis also writes that one person was responsible for cutting the purchase punches and the workmen employed in cast and workmen were employed in casting the letters were common goldsmiths, fire, goldsmiths, locksmiths, little skilled in their art, not at all at type folding. The government gazette used the FET type between the years 1802 to 1806. The writings of Ellis suggest that he intended to impose a measure of censorship 
by restricting the usage of FET. The font was reserved solely for the use of the EIC. The printer should not be allowed to use the type for, uh, for their own account. Given these circumstances, it is unlikely that FET was used in settings outside of the newspaper. The FET type is an aesthetically imperfect font. The lack of competence in the technique of cutting punches on Ellis's behalf and the workmen who undertook the task is evident in the final quality. The FET type was cut in a dubious situation with the need to quickly interpret the written script into typographic forms by non-experts, directly impact impacting the quality of the finished form. Nevertheless, it is a significant font as it satisfied the mission of rendering the Telugu script as a foundry type and commenced printing in the, the, in the Telugu script. The next Telugu font was cut by Vincent Figgins. Figgins, a prominent type founder who was instrumental in defining the styles of British printing during the 19th century. This Telugu font is referred to as VFT in this talk. Among, amongst Fickin's achievements is cutting the first lap serif font named Antique, released in 1815, and introducing the term sans serif in 1832. Figgins was responsible for many fonts that enable global scripts, including Greek, Hebrew, Persian, Bengali, Syriac, and Telugu. Berthold Wulpe asserts that Figgins was a capable punch cutter, but his role at his foundry was that of a business manager and that it's doubtful that Figgins ever participated in the physical labor of cutting type. Two printed type specimens of VFT, a four-page specimen dated 1802, titled a specimen of a font of Telugu, typecast by Vincent Figgins, London, and the other is a sample of text setting that is undated titled specimen of Telugu, of Telugu, typecast by Vincent Figgins, London, are archived by a host today, the St. Bride's Library. The image shown here is an undated specimen of Telugu types cast by Vincent Figgins, and this picture is taken by Professor James Mosley. Figgins possibly procured able punch cutters to execute his projects. Two engravers named Perry and Edmiston frequently worked at his foundry. Another punch cutter, whose name was unknown, but was referred to as the black man, also worked at the foundry. According to Wulpe, the identi identity of this man is not retrievable. No evidence indicates that Fickins procured different punch cutters to develop non-Latin types. Therefore, it is likely that VFT was cut by the black man Perry or Edmiston. Initially, in a letter dated 29th July 1800, Figgins estimates the cost of type founding of VFT to be about 500 pounds, covering the charges for 200 mattresses, 1,000 types, and other additional expenditures in making of the font. The VFT type replaced, replaced FET in 1806 in the Government Gazette newspaper. The first absurd use of the VFT font is dated Thursday, 8 May 1806, and yet again, it is a translation of a government advertisement similar to the first usage of FET. The printing conditions in Madras appear different than that of London, and the overall reproduction quality of VFT is inferior in the newspaper edition compared to the specimens stored at the St. Bride's Library, especially as the type begins to wear. It is unlikely that VFT had a significant impact on shaping of the typographic forms of the Kannada and Telugu, Telugu scripts as it fell out of favor quickly. The VFT type could have suffered considerable breakage or despite the attempts by Figgins, the eventual method of composition could have still proven challenging for the Madras workmen. The next type was made by the Sarampur mission near Kolkata and, and William Carey was instrumental in its establishment. Carey was motivated by the purpose of converting the heathen subjects of the English empire and particularly of the Indian subcontinent to Christianity. Carey was ambitious in the scale of translations and printing of the Bible that he hoped to undertake covering scripts spoken in the subcontinent and many spoken in other parts of Asia. The endeavor aimed to disseminate Christian religious texts to the native population, hoping that having access to the sacred texts 
was a key factor required for proselytization. A pertinent need for forms of various script was felt by the Sarampur missionaries to support this enormous enterprise. In 1799, Carey persuaded a local punch cutter, Panchanan Karmakara, to set up a type foundry at the mission's premises. Panchanan had worked with Charles Wilkins in casting the first Bengali font for the EIC's press at Calcutta in the Bengal Presidency. Panchanan appears to have been given a substantial role as the master type founder at the Sarampur Mission Press. Panchanan worked for three years at Sarampur Foundry and died while casting a font of Marathi in 1804. He trained several assistants, particularly Manohar Karmakara, who eventually married Panchanan's daughter and became his son-in-law. Manohar continued Panchanan's legacy by becoming the master type founder at Sarampur and worked in this capacity for more than 40 years. By 1808, with the commencement of work on grammar books and translation of religious texts into the Kannada and Telugu languages, the Serampul missionaries found the need for fonts to print in the two scripts. The ministers considered purchasing Figgins Telugu font VFT. As VFT only supported the Telugu script, and enable printing, to, to enable printing in the Kannada script, an efficient solution of cutting a few additional punches as variants at the Sarampur foundry was considered as an option. Eventually, as the Sarampur mission often worked with cost constraints, they found that the pricing of VFT, 600 pounds exclusive of metal and the additional expense of casting, expensive. William Watt speculated that the cost of casting a Telugu type at the mission's type foundry was about 2,000 rupees. Here is a spread from the book, A Grammar of the Telinga Language, printed in 1814. This spread is typeset using Latin and Telugu types, henceforth referred to as SMT. The Kannada variants of this type are called SNK. As Panchan then passed away in 1804, Manohar Karmakara and his men were most likely to have cast these Sarampur Telugu and Kannada types. The third memoir respecting the translation printed by the Sarampur mission in 1811 reports that the SMK and SMT fonts comprised of 1200 sorts. The reception to the Sarampur mission translation and printing were critically hostile. The founders of the Calcutta Unitarian Society, William Adam and Raja Ram Mohan Roy, commented in 1824 that neither one got the attention it deserved by engaging in the translation of so many languages. Roy added that the translations would not help spread Christianity and were neither accurate nor free from sectarian influence as the expression of, Christ as the expression of Christi Christian doctrine. In 1826, Marshman announced that the Sarampur missionaries would undertake no more translation and printing of the scriptures, and the remainder of their lives would be devoted to correcting the editions. The scale of the accomplishments of the Sarampur mission in type founding and printing wonders were enormous. The quality of their work was not on par with those of that of European type founders. Nevertheless, they were a significant enterprise that enabled printing in many vernacular languages. We go back, now we go back to Francis White Ellis. Since the FET font, he went on to become responsible for many advances in academic practices in Orientalism during his time, making him a significant figure in the early 19th century. He was a member of the Madras Literary Society and the founder of the College of Fort St. George, established at Madras, in 1812. Ellis was a senior member of the College of Superintendents from its founding until 1890 and was responsible for the curriculum and its growth. He was the first to suggest the Dravidian proof, a step-by-step -step attempt to establish that the Dravidian languages are interrelated and not derived from Sanskrit. Ellis wrote the note to the introduction in Alexander Campbell's A Grammar of the Telugu Language, commonly called Gen 2 elaborating the theory in 1816. You can see, see a snippet of his writing in this slide. Here is another spread, typeset with Telugu as well. The college press at Fort St. George 
established in 1813 at Madras, printed books in the Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam, and Arabic scripts. The EIC sanctioned a new Telugu type, MCT, abbreviated for Madras, Madras College Telugu, for the use of the college press. Available resources indicate that a functional type phone tree was located in Madras, catering to the vernacular font needs. Nevertheless, no resources have pointed at the identity of this type foundry and the people involved in the punch cutting process. As the quality of the reproduction of MCT demonstrate a higher level of skill in punch cutting than that of FET, it is unlikely that local workers without prior experience undertook the punch cutting. However, type making in Madras during this period appears to have been in its nascent stages. A European who had some basic knowledge in type folding and had some prior experience may be involved in making this font. The Kannada type MCK used by the college press, press shares much of its skeletal structure with MCT as both types share some of the letter forms. However, in MCK, the top hat is stylized and pronounced and is used as a differentiator between the two scripts. The Madras College Press could have faced numerous constraints when it came to the rendition of the Kannada script. The antecedents of the college were proficient in Telugu and not in the Kannada language. It might not be surprising if the person involved in making MCK realized much later that they required modification to the Telugu font to interpret the Kannada letter forms as typographic forms. Such a realization could have also laid a time constraint on the press, which could have led to resorting to the most straightforward means available at their disposal to make MCK. These four Telugu fonts, FET, BFT, SMT, and MCT, and the two Kannada types, SMK and MCK, constitute the early foundry type period. So, what can we infer from the about discus types? The VFT type shows a higher level of technical skill in the consistency of the shaping of the letter forms, and the MCT type only follows with its quirks and inconsistencies. Comparing the FET and MCK types, FET being the first Telugu type cut in Madras and MCT the first Kannada type, are lacking in the above mentioned quality and are rather rudimentary in their construction. The Sarampur mission types, SMT and SMK, appear to have been robust in construction, though sparsely used. The need to differentiate the scripts through the styling also appears to have been introduced during this period. Attempts to improve the functionality of types to ease the process of typesetting saw the methods of composition being in a state of flux. A combination of solid, account, and degree methods of compositions were employed in order to arrive at an efficient solution that allowed ease of typesetting while at the same time reducing the wear of the types. The rendition of the Telugu script as typographic forms received a disproportionate significance as the language was spoken in Madras, the capital of the Madras presidency. The Kannada script did not receive the same importance in the quality and quantity of fonts, and the number of publication is also much smaller. By chance, the location where the forms were cut had a significant consequence on modulation and stroke contrast of these forms. The FET type has a very low stroke, stroke contrast. FET was influenced by the shaping of the letters as found in palm leaf manuscripts unintentionally. Traditionally, in southern India, a pointed metal stylus was used to make an incision, incision on the prepared palm leaves, which was then smeared with a form of ink, such as soot and then cleaned with sand. This method helped the ink to settle in the incised letters and make them visible. The letters had low modulation and stroke contrast, uh, stroke contrast. As the workmen who cut the types of FET were native to southern India, being goldsmiths and locksmiths, they did not have preconceived notions of the appearance of typographic forms. The lack of experience of the workmen meant they were influenced by the letter forms that they were most familiar with. Hence, as a natural progression, the typographic forms share, shared a semblance with the palm leaf manuscript forms. Bear in mind that during this period, sans fonts were not yet in commonplace. In comparison to FET, PFT was made in London by English punch cutters. 
The modulation in VFT is reminiscent of the dip pen, the de facto writing tool in Europe. Writing with this tool creates a stroke contrast and modulation that is perpendicular to the baseline. Kannada and Telugu written samples from the 18th and 19th century by Europeans such as this folio in Planches de l'Encyclopedia Methodic, 1780 by Denis Diderot and John Leronde d'Alembert demonstrate the stroke gaining weight perpendicular to the baseline. The slide shows a part of this plate. Besides, in Europe, during the early, early 18th century, printing and paper making developments led to the emergence of a higher stroke contrast trend. Type founders demonstrated their skill by cutting fine hairline strokes known as the modern genre of Latin, Latin type. Friggins contributed to this growth by cutting types such as the Great Primer that catered to this trend. As the, foundry type, as, as the foundry attempted to exhibit its finesse, this high contrast and modulation could have found its way in the cutting of Telugu fonts. The ensuing types from the early foundry type period mimicked a similar modulation in stroke contrast like that created using European writing tools. While there are other findings regarding the details of the letter fonts, due to the limited time available for this talk, I will not be delving into them. While looking at the types from the early foundry period, I was also fortunate to stumble upon a book that was previously unknown. It is widely recognized that a grammar of the Telinga language and the grammar of the Kurnata language by William Carey, printed at the Sarampur Mission Press in 1814 and 1817 respectively, are the first printed books in the Kannada and Telugu languages. However, this book predates the Telugu grammar and is of significance to the printing and publishing history in the Telugu script and is an interesting story and is an interesting story to share. A significant event in English as well as Indian history was the establishment of the East India Company. Consequential developments in printing in the Indian vernaculars ensued under the influence of the EIC. According to the Indologist Graham Shaw, the EIC, in associating political power to its economic interests, found the need to print in the areas administered by it. During the first hundred years, EIC concentrated on trade in India. Eventually, the EIC changed from a trading company into an administrative agent and colonizing agency with broad powers granted by the British government. On 20th August 1639, Francis Day acquired Madras Patna to access a port that would allow the approach to the Malakin Straits. This event led to the founding of the city of Madras, currently known as Chennai. A year later, the EIC built a uh, Fort St. George in Madras and established a factory that later became the Madras Presidency. We are looking at a sketch of this fort. The EIC did not clearly state its religious policy, yet maintained a policy of neutrality towards Indian religions. Its primary interest was trade and profit, and therefore, it tried not to combine commerce with Christianity. Once the AIC assumed territorial rights, rights it assured Indians that they would be allowed freedom of worship. Meanwhile, Protestantism was gaining a foothold in England. Being disturbed by the slave trade and convinced of all people's equal rights, English Protestant missionaries started viewing the inhabitants of their colonies as heathen subjects of the English empire. They found it pertinent to intervene with their religious beliefs and evangelize the colonies. The historian Susan Thorne writes that missionary imperialism propagated equality but did not question the moral validity of Europe's imperial domination of the non-European world with the opinion that missionary modes of control were effective guarantees of European power in colonies. This reasoning gave rise to English missionaries, missionaries intending to evangelize their territories. The Indian subcontinent saw a surge of preachers arriving at its shore during the later part of the 18th century. A set of English missionaries from the London Missionary Society traveled from Copenhagen in a Danish ship to Tantibar and arrived in December 1804, intending to establish a mission in Sri Lanka. Augustus Desgranges, 
and George Cran moved to Vishakhapatnam on 18 July 18, 1805 and set up a mission with a permission from the ES. The two LMS missionaries, Augustus Desbrandes and George, George Cran, who set up the mission in Vishakhapatnam, were keen to learn Telugu, to translate the Gospels and preach to the native. Desbrandes' journal indicates that John Taylor, a Scottish missionary and surgeon who had established a mission in Gujarat, requested Desbrandes and Cran to undertake the translation of the Gospels into Kannada and Telugu. Desgranges and Cran acquired a Telugu grammar and dictionary in manuscript form to learn the languages. The missionaries translated the first two chapters of the Gospel of Matthew to Telugu by 28 September 1807. In May 1808, a native convert, Anandarayal, joined the two LMS missionaries to undertake translation. Anandarayal was a Brahmin and had previously converted to the Roman Catholic faith and changed his name from Subarayal. He eventually denounced being a Roman Catholic and became a Protestant. He was a native of Vishagapatna. Anandarayar was also LMS's first convert in India. Significant progress in the translation happened after Anandarayar joined the mission. Anandarayar presided over the translation and this branches employed four other Brahmins to transcribe the material. This branches daily mentions other converts such as Purushottam, Jagan Nagam, Shanmukaram and Brahmaji and Venkatra. The Telugu translations of the Gospel of Matthew was completed by 15th May 1809. The Gospel of John was commenced on 6th September 1809 and the Gospel of Luke was completed on 16th June 1810. The LMS missionary sent copies to a Dr. Brown, the Sarampur mission and the British and Foreign Bible Society. Adversity struck the intentions of the LMS missionaries in numerous ways. An unnamed friend of this branches sailed with the manuscript to Bengal in a ship that capsized. The friend survived the event and managed to save the manuscript, while all other articles in the vessel sunk. This branches, the driving force behind this endeavor, fell seriously ill and died at 30 years in July 1810. Some favorable occurrences helped to further the undertaking. The LMS sent other missionaries to continue the, continue the evangelical work at Vishakhapatna. The ministers, John Gordon and William Lee, arrived in 1810 and Edward Pritchett in 1811. The VFBS granted £2,000 for the translation and printing of works in Indian languages for the year 1811 to 13. Half of the sum was for the agencies in India that were involved in the translation. The other half for the Sarampur mission for the cost of printing. The financial resource was used to fund the printing of the LMS manuscript. In 1811, Anand Raya visited Sarampur to supervise the printing process of the Synoptic Gospels translated in Vishakhapatna. The LMS missionaries received a letter from Sarampur informing that the Telugu types were not yet ready and received a specimen of the first chapter of St. Mark's Gospel. The missionaries made Further corrections. The LMS missionaries responded requesting to commence printing the other chapters and wait for the revised version of the Gospel of Mark. Eventually, the Sarampur Mission Press published this edition of the Telugu Synoptic Gospels in 1812. A small supply of 50 copies of this title was sent to the LMS mission at Vishakhapatnam to help their evangelical efforts. Three copies of this book are known to exist. The first copy is held at the British Library. This copy is dated, crediting the Sarampur mission, yes, as the printer. The British Library has restricted access to captured images of this book. According to Arani Ilan Kuberin, curator of South India Collections, the British Library acquired the book on 12th November 1844. The second copy is held at the School of Oriental and African Studies. The title leaf and the date are missing, and it is listed as a generic Telugu Bible. A third copy is available at the British and Foreign Bible Society Archives, University of Cambridge. This copy has the title page intact. In March 1812, a fire broke out at the Sarampur printing office, starting on a range of shelves containing paper. 
William Ward attempted to salvage the material and save lives. The fire continued burning for two days. The fire destroyed types, furniture, paper, manuscript, and printed books. On Kannada and Telugu, 14 Telugu types, a manuscript copy of the Telugu grammar, and translated scriptures and published works in Telugu, such as the New Testament, were all consumed by the fire. The majority of the printed copies of the Synoptic, Synoptic Gospels, apart from the 50 books previously sent to the LMS missionaries, were unfortunately destroyed by this fire. The omission of the first book from historical records could have occurred as the Sarampur missionaries kept a log of the books they translated and printed. Still, they may not have reported the printing works that they undertook for other missions in their records. The survival of this book was possibly not anticipated as the fire in the Sarampur mission press is well documented academically. Usually, title pages of vernacular books printed in the subcontinent were bilingual or set in English and the vernacular script. However, in the case of this synoptic gospel, the title page of this book is printed entirely in Telugu. This slide shows an image of this title page. page. This choice could have made it difficult for later scholars to place the date for publishing this book. Two establishments were significant in the later Fontrejack period. The English type founder Richard Watts and the Canada fonts of the Basel, Basel Mission Press. The fonts of Richard Watts were used by various Christian mission organizations such as the London Missionary Society's Bendari Mission Press that served the Telugu-speaking region and the Wesleyan Mission which was active in the Kannada-speaking region while that of the Basel Mission, Basel Mission was used exclusively by their presses at Mangalore. Richard Watts was a tag founder based out of England, known explicitly for cutting the punches of numerous non latin fonts. Two type specimens are archived at the Sendrites Library that showcases his Kannada and Telugu fonts. Here, you are looking at the Oriental and other types in 67 languages or dialects, principally prepared by the late Mr. Watts and now in use in W. M. Watts's office, 1850. This specimen is undated, vertical in format, and claims to showcase fonts cast exclusively for the Oxford Press, and it's stamped TB Read on the right-hand top corner. Little information is available about Watts's early life. David McKitterick, in the book, A History of the Cambridge University Press, Volume 2, discusses Watts's background. Watts's father was a shopkeeper at Abingdon in Oxfordshire. Between 1795 to 6, he ran a newspaper called the Oxford Mercury and Midland Country Chronicle for a short while. Richard Watts ran an establishment at Falcon Court, Fleet Street in London and landed a position as the official printer at the University of Cambridge between 1802 to 1809. This tenure eventually turned out to be objectionable to Watts's reputation as well as the press's functioning. This is the second specimen, Oriental and other types in 100 languages or dialects, principally prepared by the late Mr. Watts and now in use at W.M. Watts's office, 1850, is in horizontal format. Watts's foundry at Crown Court Temple Bar was a successful establishment known as his Oriental type foundry location. With the patronage of the BFPS and other mission presses in India, Watts cut punches for various fonts for many Oriental languages. It is believed that he received assistance from many eminent scholars, some of whom personally superintended the execution of some of the fonts. This slide shows the close-up of two Kannada types from the specimen with 100 languages. Watts was not a consequential type founder. And his achievement was not the quality of his work, but the wide range of non-Latin fonts that he cut. This belief is well captured by the type founder, Talbot Payne Reads, in his book, A History of the Old English Letter Foundries, listing Watts as a minor type founder who worked between the periods 1800 to 1830. Consequently, the success of Watts may be related to his business capabilities rather than his type founding abilities. 
This slide shows the remaining Kannada and one Telugu type from the specimen with 100 languages. I'd like to thank Erin McLaughlin for sharing the images that were presented in the last three slides. Watts's collection increased rapidly, and at the time of his death, it included every Oriental language that had printed the scriptures. He appears to have moved his foundry to Edmonton at an unknown date, where he died in 1844. On Richard Watts's demise, his establishment was passed on to his son, William Mayer Watts. W.M. Watts's print establishment was located at Grace Inn Road, and it succumbed to fire on the 19th of March, 1870. This fire destroyed the types, but the mattresses and bunches survived unaffected. Following the fire, W.M. Watts moved his establishment to Whitefriars Street. Shortly afterwards, in 1874, W.M. Watts passed away. W.M. Watts's wife sold the establishment to the London printers Gilbert and Rivington. The collection of Oriental fonts acquired by Gilbert and Rivington was subsequently purchased by William Cloves and Sons, Sons Printing Company in 1908. The Basel Missionary Society was one of the earliest European missions to use the EIC's updated religious policy of neutrality by establishing a mission at Mangalore, India in 1834. A significant focus of the Basel mission in the areas that it operated was to create employment opportunities for the people residing in that particular location. To this end, the society initiated printing, tile manufacturing, weaving in the uh, weaving endeavors in the Indian subcontinent. The Basel mission was also res responsible for establishing a weaving initiative that equated the popular khaki dye and the renowned Mangalore tile industry and extended its commercial portfolio to coffee, cashew, and sandalwood tree. This slide shows a skyline of Mangalore tiles used for roofing at Mangalore. The Basel Mission also set up printing presses and is credited for printing the first Kannada newspaper, shown on this slide, and several religious and school books. According to Graham Shaw, the Basel Mission established two lithographic presses in Mangalore and Talasheri to publish in the local, local languages, Kannada and Malayalam, respectively. According to Graham Shaw, the missionary Herman Moogling, who was born in 1811, the editor of the Mangalore Samacha, the first Kannada news, newspaper, proposed replacing the lithographic press during his visit to Basel in the summer of 1846. Moogling was interested with procuring a press and initiating the cutting of the punches of a new Canada of new Canada types. For the type requirements, Moglik visited Leipzig and Paris to consult the Asian scholars Julius von Moll and Eugene Bernoff. The process, the progress of this undertaking was slow, and the printer was only sent to India five years later. The Basel Missionary Society sent Jörg Plebst, a printer trained in Stuttgart, to Mangalore in 1851 to establish a press and conduct the, print, and conduct the printing office. Plebst was trained as an engineer but had to forego his career due to nervous complications. Plebst served as an apprentice at a print establishment in Stuttgart and learned stereotype printing at the workshop of Freyer von Kota, a friend of the Basel Mission. He was responsible for preparing the workers and adapting two Kannada fonts cut in Europe, one too large and the other poorly built. The imminent need for fonts eventually led him to establish a type foundry as well. The press printed numerous school textbooks, religious books, tracts, and printing for different presidencies through this well organized on the world. The Basel mission appears not just to have emphasized on proselytization, but also to have a genuine interest to establish and conduct its business ventures for the benefit of society. Now let's look at the two fonts that Plebs found unsatisfactory. A specimen, old standings, Tanerishis alphabet in 369 types of garment und petit kegel, 1851, and its supplement, Caraman Canarish, is archived at Mission 21 in Switzerland. A zoom of this document is shown in this slide. 
The credits mentioned that the Kannada type was cut in steel by R. Bookhart, an engraver, and the mattresses were leveled in copper by W. Haas, both located at Basel. Woodcart is a relatively unknown punch cutter, while W. Haas could have been a descendant of William Haas. The Haas type foundry traces its origin to John Exertier and Jacques Foyer, who founded a printing press in Basel as early as 1580. The two fonts are referred to as RBK1 and RBK2 in honor of Woodcart. The RBK1 font was used in the 1851 specimen and it con that consisted of 369 sorts and the ligatures were cast solid. I was only able to find the RBK2 font in printed books such as the one shown in this slide. Upon his arrival, Plebs installed the new letterpress in the printing office. According to the chronological narrative, under Plebs' superintendence, the print establishment commenced it at, at its activities by teaching two black boys printing mechanics. However, acquiring suitable fonts proved challenging. Plebs realized that he required a type foundry within reasonable distance to work efficiently and familiarize himself independently on the subject. Therefore, a type foundry was established in Mangalore, and new Kannada fonts were cut and cast here. He trained a Chinese man baptized in Mangalore named Tommy for mechanical works, possibly cutting the punches and casting type. Tommy was a skilled punch cutter and worked with good precision. Tommy was equipped with an assistant, Rahum, who became the principal type founder after Tommy's demise. Plebs worked in Mangalore for nine years. Upon completing the first significant accomplishment, the printing of the New Testament or the Calvary, Calvary Bible work, he returned to Europe in 1861, leaving the management of the print establishment to his assistant, Jakob Kunzika. While in Europe, Plebs managed the cutting of additional Canada type faces. He then got married and traveled with Caspar Stolz black back to Mangalore, who was to replace Kunzika. However, on their arrival, the printing house and the type foundry needed reorganization. Their activities were being extended with the installation of a new rapid press establishing a casting unit, commencing stereotype printing and an intention to print in the Malayalam script. Therefore, all three worked at the establishment. Two Kannada type specimens, the specimen book of Basel Mission Press, 1882, and specimens of printing in 10 different languages at the Basel Mission Press, 1907, are available at the Mission 21 archives. Correspondences and records in English are in English, modern German, German black letter, and the subtle script. However, there are particular challenges in deciphering these archival sources, as the correspondences in the subtle script that is no longer in use are practically unreadable. The specimen book of the Basel Mission Press, 1882, consists of four pages and showcases a total of 18 fonts of which 11 are text type families and the remaining seven are title types. Whether cut in Mangalore by Kaume or Rahum or in Europe, credits for these typefaces are difficult to determine as other records have not been accessible to this research. The 11 text type families are grouped into four families, English, Pika, Long Primer, and an interspaced fat type. However, the families are not used consistently. The types used in the 1907 specimen is a smaller section from the 1882 specimen. You can see the rest of the 1882 specimen here. Stephen Neal mentions that the Madras mail in 1873 described the works of the Basin Mission Press as the best in the Madras presidency. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 crippled the organization in Basel and arrested missionary activities in India. All of its firms, schools, etc., except the printing press, slipped out of its control and were handed over to the Commonwealth Trust, a British company. Although the Crown withdrew restrictions in 1927, the government reimposed them again in 1939 due to World War II. Just after World War II, the British themselves had to leave the country as India gained its independence. Mm -hmm. The American Baptist Mission sent S.S. Day and his wife, their first missionaries, to Vishakhapatnam in 1836. 
They established a Telugu mission in Nello in 1840. Other subsequent missionaries established more stations to extend their geographical coverage. According to Edmund Merriam, the evangelistic method used in the Ongol mission revolutionized, revolutionized missionary policy. During the early year, years of the mission in India, a predominant development on educational lines favored formality and a slow upbuilding of Christianity. Merriam credits Klo for swinging the pendulum towards the evangelistic slide, side. This statement remains unverifiable as the EIC did not pass any acts during this period that could have supported this claim. However, it emphasizes that Telugu missions focus on conversion rather than education or its ancillary need, printing. The American missionaries printed various publications in Madras. However, three books located at the American Baptist Historical Society our society archives at the Mercer University, Atlanta, are published by the American Baptist Mission Presses in the Telugu speaking regions such as Rampattam, Ongol, and Nellore in the Telugu language with Telugu counter Little information is av available about the history concerning the American Baptist Mission Press in southern India. Their contribution towards establishing industrial undertakings in the Telugu region was likely negligible compared to that of the Basel mission in the Canada speaking regions. So, what did we see overall? When it comes to modulation and stroke contrast, a noticeable feature of the later formed type in the Canada and Telugu script was its introduction that was parallel to the baseline. Richard Watts's Katada types are the earliest points punch cut in this style. The Basel mission punch cut an eclectic collection of Kannada fonts in varying sizes and varying degrees of modulation and stroke contrast. In the Kannada types punch cut by Burkhard at Basel, the modulation and stroke contrast is not very really pronounced and is parallel to the baseline. These two fonts were not hallmark of Basel mission's Kannada typography. Under Georg Plebs' supervision, the width and breadth of Kannada type collection grew and it comprised of multiple families that had stroke contrast and modulation applied parallel to the baseline. The Islamic influence in the culture, politics and socio-economics of southern India is often unduly overlooked. The Mughal Empire ruled areas of the Indian subcontinent between the 16th to mid 19th century AD. The Mughals were Mongol elites assimilating into the Turkic population and adopted Islam and the Turkic languages while maintaining Mongol political and legal institutions. Babur was a direct descendant of Emperor Timur and came from modern day Uzbekistan. During Aurangzeb's rule of 49 years, 49 years he expanded the Mughal territories to its greatest extent. The empire stretched from Chittagong in the east to Kabul and Baluchistan in the west, and from Kashmir in the north to Kaveri Basin in the south. In medieval southern India, parts of the Kannada and Telugu speaking regions were governed by Muslim rulers. The Bahmani Sultanates were one of the earliest Islamic kingdoms in South India that governed parts that spoke Kannada and Telugu languages. The Deccan Sultanates were eventually annexed into the Mughal Empire during Aurangzeb's rule. It split to form the five Deccan Sultanates of Ahmednagar, Bayrat, Bidar, Bijapur, and Golconda. Other rulers, such as the Nizams of Hyderabad and the Mysore, kingdoms, Mysore Kingdom of Hyder Ali and his son, Tipu Sultan, were notable Muslim dynasty, dynasties of southern India. The architectural buildings, Golgumbas of the Bijapur Sultanate, and Charminar in Hyderabad of the Golconda Sultanate are reminiscent of this period. Writing on paper with Islamic calligraphic pen appears to have been known and possibly practiced under Islamic rulers. For instance, affluent Muslim collected the Murakka, an album containing miniature paintings and specimens of Islamic calligraphy, which compiled the, which was compiled to the owner's face. You are seeing a sample on the slide. The earliest murakka consisted only of calligraphy. In the South Indian regions ruled by Islamic dynasties, 
the people spoke Persian, Deccani, Urdu, Marathi, Kannada, and Telugu. It is only possible that the ruling elite could have extended the traditional writing materials used to transcribe Persian and Deccani Urdu to write the Kannada and Telugu scripts. The British Library archives a collection of Kannada documents awaiting identification dated between 9th November 1826 to 19th October 1833. The handwritten letter forms found in this file show varying styles and levels of stroke contrast parallel to the baseline, especially in the outstroke that extend to the ascender and descender spaces, created by using the quill pen on paper. As the Kannada and Telugu scripts have curly letter forms, adding weight to the outstroke naturally produced horizontal stress. This horizontal stress would have shaped the styling of the Kannada and Telugu letter forms similar to that of the Nastalik script, frequently used to tra transcribe the Kani Urdu, the language used by the Islamic dynasties. Experiments with writing the Kannada and Telugu script using these writing materials give rise to letter forms with modulation and stroke contrast parallel to the baseline. Therefore, it is possible that the modulation and stroke contrast was the result of writing with Islamic writing tools that was prevalent in that region. The scripts were standardized and differentiation of typographic forms between Kannada and Telugu occurred, occurred, occurred. Different handwriting styles were prevalent during the early part of the 19th century. In the book, specimen of various vernacular characters passing through the post office in India, different handwriting styles of several Indian vernacular languages are exhibited based on social divisions and geographic locations. You are seeing a sample of on the slide. Given these multiple writing styles, variant letters must have existed. According to Imtiaz Hasnin, competing identities involving Hindi, Urdu, and Hindustani have shaped the historical, political, and social fabric of groups and communities in the geopolitical space that constitute Indian society. It is a widely held belief in the Indian subcontinent that once the Telugu language started using the old Kannada script, its evolution to develop a unique identity occurred individually and organically over time rather than an abrupt split. This belief, mainly supported by the native population, represents a sense of linguistic pride and the desire to possess their own identity. The typographic interpretation of the top hat appears to have evolved organically through the first half of the 19th century. No apparent difference between the two scripts is observed in the 18th and 19th centuries in written forms. The college at Fort St. George possibly introduced the detail as the flattened Kannada specific top hat style is not observed in manuscript form before the Madras forms. As the college consisted of scholarly elite and was responsible for many advancements, including introducing new vowels, a deliberate decision could have been made to differentiate between the Kannada and Telugu scripts by styling the top hats differently. These were the major findings of my research. However, I have omitted details as it's not possible to cover the entire width and breadth of the research. I'm humbled that so many of you joined this talk and I thank you for taking the time to attend this talk. I hope I told an interesting enough story. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have.